Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I wanted to talk about a question I get asked fairly often by people not in healthcare, and that is, my dad, my mom, my uncle, my aunt, someone in my family is having heart surgery. What does that mean in terms of the anesthesia? They have accepted the fact that the surgeons are going to do X, Y, and Z on the aorta or the heart or the valves or whatever, but from the anesthesia standpoint and also from the perfusion standpoint, what is this heart-lung machine thing? What is waking up in the ICU a day later? Why is the breathing tube still left in? What can I expect in the morning? How much are they going to poke me? Like these questions are getting pretty often. So my job is your safety above everything first and foremost, but to do that there are certain things we need to have in place before we actually go off to sleep. So with this video I'm going to talk about things to expect if you're a patient coming in for heart surgery before the surgery, during, as well as afterwards, which is usually more relevant for family members and caretakers who are there. One of the benefits of being ICU trained is I actually spend a lot of time with patients after the surgery, so I know how they recover after these things. And it's no surprise when the intraoperative decisions we make translate to certain outcomes postoperatively. One thing we always have to keep in mind, though, is we as physicians, nurses, perfusionists, whoever is in the operating room, do this every day. And we don't take it lightly. Your safety, again, is our priority. You don't get this done every day, so it's normal to feel anxious before any surgery, but these in particular are very involved. And patients, a lot of the times, doesn't matter how stoic they are, they'll tell me in private, hey doc, I'm really nervous. So I use that as an opportunity to build a relationship with the patient because I feel like fear a lot of the times is spurred by not knowing what to expect. So I take that time to, to walk them through what to expect and that's what I'm trying to do with this video. So let's start the morning of. Now, I've not had a family member that's gone for heart surgery, but I'm gonna try to pretend like I'm a patient, what to expect. So if I'm a first case, typically it starts around 7 or 7.30. I'm probably waking up around 4 o'clock to get to the hospital around 5 o'clock, 5.30 or so. So already I'm, I'm tired, I'm miserable, I'm nervous. It's a bad combination. A lot of hospitals around the country are starting to do what's called enhanced recovery after surgery, ERAS. And that's partly involving preoperative care. And what I mean by that is one thing we do is give our patients carbohydrate-rich beverages. The morning of, typically it's on the way to their hospital, uh, sometimes including the evening before. And the idea is we want patients to be happy. We don't want them starving. Um, it, it's been shown to mitigate some of the insulin response post-op. It's been shown to help with hydration, things like that. So overall, pros versus cons, the benefits outweigh the risks. The other thing we'll do preoperatively is give you pill medications, kind of as part of that ERAS protocol, things like Tylenol, gabapentin, Lyrica, Celebrex, depending on the kind of surgery. And this is not just heart surgery. This is a lot of surgeries these days, colorectal, orthopedic, and so on and so forth. So now you're in the pre-op area. You've already changed into your gown, and uh, a nurse is going to be checking you in, getting your medications and history and allergies, last time you ate, things like that, things that we have to address before we go back to the operating room. The surgery and anesthesia teams will typically show up half hour to an hour before we actually roll back, verify their consents, make sure all the paperwork is done. We'll get to meet the family and caretakers as well and answer any questions you all may have at that point. Now, depending on the institution, you may get some of those pill medications that I mentioned earlier. The nurse or the anesthesia team may split responsibilities in terms of who starts the peripheral IV as well. Once the IV is in, that's when I give a little bit of sedation because I try to get the arterial line, which is a monitor that we put typically in the wrist, in the radial artery, that measures your blood pressure continuously every time your heart beats. And it's almost standard of care to have that for cardiac surgery. Really, really healthy patients, I sometimes can do it after induction, but the overwhelming majority of them, I put it in before we actually go off to sleep. Use some numbing medication and sedation. It's usually not a big deal. And this is where I take advantage of some time to give my spiel to patients, talk to them about what they can expect before they go off to sleep from that moment. So I tell them we'll go back to the room, We'll give you a little bit more relaxing medication. We'll go through a timeout procedure where basically the nurses, the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, and the perfusionists all discuss the plan, any concerns they may have, verify that, for example, if we're doing a valve repair or a replacement, what specific kind of valve are they amenable to? Does the patient want a mechanical valve, a tissue valve? Exactly what things should we be addressing during this procedure? So it's on the consent form, it's in the chart and all that, but again, one final time, we do it. This is our surgical safety timeout. 
either before or immediately after the surgical timeout, we're connecting all of our perioperative standard monitors. So our pulse oximeter, our EKG stickers, our defibrillator pads, connecting the arterial line we put into our monitors. Basically, those are the monitors we need to safely go off to sleep. At that point, we'll hand you an oxygen mask that you'll breathe in just oxygen, get rid of all the, the nitrogen and the carbon dioxide and everything else, and get you prepared for general anesthesia. Then the anesthesiologist will start administering medication. So I'll give a combination of a hypnotic, a paralytic, a narcotic, all these medications to facilitate tracheal intubation. After you're asleep, we'll put a breathing tube in, and that breathing tube is going to stay with them till after the surgery in most cases. A lot of institutions keep patients intubated and move them to the ICU and then try to extubate them within a couple hours. Some places, depending on how the surgery goes, try to extubate in the room. So again, just depends on the institution. After you're asleep, we'll protect the eyes, position, drape you, make sure everything is nice and padded, get usually another IV. But then what we're planning for is the central line, which is a big IV that we typically put in the right neck. I like to put it kind of in the left shoulder area, right below the clavicle. This is an example of what it looks like. So you're asleep for this, obviously, and we use standard uh, universal sterility precautions to put these things in because you don't want these things getting infected. Here's another example of a, a longer but a smaller catheter. So depending on the situation, we'll decide what kind of catheter we need. Depending on how the workflow is going, either before the central line or immediately afterwards, I'll also put a transesophageal echo probe in, depending on if it's warranted for the case. So for, for valve repairs or replacements, almost always, unless a patient has a contraindication. In that case, we would just do an epicardiac uh, ultrasound just to make sure the valve looks okay. But this comes in handy for line placement, especially if it's a subclavian, um, but more importantly for us to get an initial exam of the heart before bypass so we can reevaluate and make sure everything is sort of as billed based on imaging that was done before the surgery. Okay, so you all are with me at this point. We've gotten to the hospital, gotten some medications, got a peripheral IV, an arterial line. Now we're off to sleep. Breathing tube is in, central line is in, TE probe is in. We're positioned, we're now prepping, where the nurses typically are putting a Foley in at the same time, and then we're going to start prepping the surgical field, which can extend anywhere from like the chin all the way down, including the groins, depending on what, what's actually involved or anticipated for the surgery. And without making this video overly complex, I'm not going to get into the actual surgery itself. Obviously, I'm not a surgeon, but I've seen enough of these done where I sort of know all the major steps of the surgeries, which is important. And as an anesthesiologist, I want to know what the critical parts are so I can anticipate problems before they actually come up. So at this point, I've got blood in the room. It's been checked and verified with the second party. Uh, I've got my echo exam done. I'm relaying my findings to the surgeon. We're deciding, okay, do we need to do something else or do we need to do more? Do we need to address an issue that was not seen beforehand? All these discussions are going back and forth across the drape between myself and the surgical colleagues. All right, so we're getting near the end of surgery now. We're off the heart-lung machine. Things are looking great. The surgeons have started closing the chest, putting the wires in. And at this point, while I'm keeping an eye on the monitors, I'm getting a little tray of medications for emergency purposes for transport. I'm preparing my lines and tubes and all of that to consolidate them in preparation for transport. Once everything is said and done, we confirm that everyone is happy, that there's nothing that was unusual. We do sort of a debriefing. We'll move you to the transport bed, reconnect you to portable monitors, and then be on our way to the ICU. So when we get to the ICU, we try to do a smooth handoff to our nursing and ICU colleagues. We will help them with connecting monitors. We'll relay any information in a formal handoff to the ICU team, intraoperative findings, unusual circumstances, things that we just didn't expect. Was the airway more difficult? What's the patient's access at this point? How much blood did we have to transfuse? Things like that. And once all of that is done, where we're happy, the ICU team is happy, that's where we part ways. The anesthesia team and the surgery team go back to the operating room, likely for a second patient, and uh, we'll address any ICU concerns if they come up while we're in the operating room. Now just having some insight as an intensivist, once patients are in the ICU, we try to get that breathing tube out as soon as possible. So unless there's a, a convincing reason we're very worried about bleeding that's going on or acidosis or something about the labs doesn't look good or they're just not quite strong enough on the ventilator, we're going to try to take that tube out within a couple hours or so. So hopefully this video answers some questions and sort of illustrates what to expect pre, intra, and post-operatively. 
in this particular case, we were talking about cardiac surgery, but a lot of these steps apply to any kind of surgery. If you all have any other questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'd be happy to address them. Uh, until next time, I'll catch you all later. Have a great remaining week.